All right, everybody, welcome back to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. I'm not Sean Finder, I'm Ollie Whitford. You might know that by now, and uh, and with me is my good friend Adam, but we don't have Sean today, so it's just the two of us. I'm sure we'll be all right, but I guess I should kind of finish the rest of the intro as Sean does. I don't have the script up, so I can't do it exactly how he does. I apologize. But this show is brought to you by Order Clothes of Vanilla Soft Company, and he would now ask me, so who's our guest today? Well... I kind of alluded to it. So we have Adam from Casted. And Casted is one of the tools that we use uh, for Nilla Soft and Order Clothes. You might have seen some of the clips that we put out of this podcast. Well, now you know where we make them from. And Cast is, uh, we could use it for a range of things. So maybe Adam can, uh, can tell us a bit more about that. But we'll, we'll get through the story of how Casted started and where it is right now. So Adam, how's it going? Welcome to the show. Yeah, it's, it's going really well. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. So, um... I like weirdly went through some of the things that Casted does. Where did it start? What's the deal? How did you get to that moment where you started working and Casted yeah, was your 100%? Um, it's one of those stories that you found yourself telling a thousand times and I still had sick of it, right? <laughs> um, so Casted got started um, back in uh, 2019 and uh, my co-founder, Lindsay, she was running a podcast uh, pretty ahead of the curve. She was working at a uh, B2B uh, email marketing company. Uh, and she was leading the marketing team there. So she was running a podcast and uh, our CEO was like high-fiving her in the hallway, like, great job. I love the podcast this morning. It was so cool. And, uh, you know, she would sit in a meeting with him the next week and he'd be like, I really like the podcast, but what's it doing for the business? Like, tell me how many leads it's bringing in. Tell me like how much web traffic we're seeing from it. She's like, ah, I don't know. I can tell you how many downloads we have, but I have no way of tying it to the rest of my marketing. Uh, and that's where that aha moment came from is, is how do we help people like Lindsay and my co-founder who's sitting in that seat of doing this awesome thing and knowing the value of podcasting and, and, and the value of that intimacy of the, the audio platform and uh, being able to demonstrate the business value and the marketing value. So when did you get involved, start? What, what was that first like we're full time now moment? Yeah. So we started it in April 2019. Um, Lindsay was uh, looking for somebody who could uh, lead the product organization, which is uh, where I came in. Uh, I have a strange mix of being able to do some solutions consulting, and I know the SaaS space pretty well, and uh, have a background in engineering. Um, so we kicked the thing off together, and uh, we started as part of a uh, studio company through High Alpha, uh, which is an awesome organization in Indianapolis, Indiana, that um, helps companies like ours uh, get off the ground, um, get the the basics out of the way, a lot of the legals and logistics, and, and get an engineering team together. And uh, yeah, kind of took off from there. So um, tell me about some first clients. And I'd, I'd be interested, these types of things, it's software, things change. Um, did you... Did you offer something a little bit different at that point as opposed to what yeah. you do now or was it kind of similar? And, and how did you get those first few clients? Yeah, it's, um, we're one of those rare companies that sold our first com- or sold our first deal before we had actual software built. So while we were putting together MVP, we actually sold our first customer Terminus. And we were able to make that deal happen because we were basically selling to the vision um, uh, of their CEO at the time. And so he was really excited about having the opportunity to legitimize his podcast uh, inside the business. And so we said, you know what? You're not just paying us for the product that we will come out with. Uh, you're paying us for the ability to influence what that product is. Uh, and that worked really well. And uh, after Terminus, we kind of had a similar deal with uh, Salesforce um, and Drift were three of our earliest customers. Uh, and it was all about that. It was like, how do we not just deliver you a product, a piece of software, but a whole solution, including um, your own custom technology team where we can put together the thing that you've always wanted uh, to help with your, your, your podcasting challenges. Terminus and Drift. Not yep. what I was expecting to say, to be honest. Yeah. Most companies, it is not like that. It ends up being like that if they can. Right. Um, why is your story so different? Um, I, I, obviously, you just kind of explained, but most people, it's like family and friends, like, you know, peers, previous colleagues, the, the network, basically the immediate yeah. network. And then they end up somewhat going outbound. 
or you know people they meet at conferences but you, you've walked straight into pretty much the household logos yeah i think some of the benefit is we have been in the marketing space right so we know folks at terminus and drift and salesforce because we've we've shared like you mentioned conference rooms with them and um you know the other benefit too is being part of a studio model um we are less distracted on those early funding stages. Uh, we're less distracted on, you know, how do we put together Performa and a lot of our financials and we're able to actually focus on how do we get people to help us define what the problem in the market is. Um, if you're familiar with like the, you know, technology adoption lifecycle curve, right? You start with these people who are just lunatics and will buy the first of anything because uh, they have to be on the cutting edge. Uh, and right after them are these visionaries, these people who uh, are willing to take heavier risks in order to be ahead of the market. Uh, and that's where we focused 100% of our attention. Um, it wasn't about acquiring um, specific logos. It was more about acquiring visionaries and, and acquiring people who are early adopters and risk takers who wanted to prove the value of podcasting uh, to the rest of the world. So when you're dealing with people like that, I'm going to imagine the feedback loop is absolutely paramount. You yeah. need to hear back from them. You need to hear real-time feedback all the time. That means you can develop new things, change the offering a bit if needed, or all those things. How did you make sure you got it, and what kinds of things did you hear? Yeah, it's uh, it's it definitely a pain, right? There's a lot of overhead. Uh, and you have big personalities too, right? And they're wonderful, and they have so many good ideas and it can be really difficult to distill down what of those ideas have the most market viability to the rest of the market. Um, and you run into this is something that I've, you know, kind of spoke on as a product leader a lot. You run into um, a couple of biases that can misdirect you uh, as a product developer and as a trying to bring something to market. Uh, it can be quite tricky to avoid those, but um Luckily, you know, we had Lindsay who had lived it, right? And it was her vision of like, how do we solve this? And so whenever we felt like, is this the right next thing? We would always gut check against what would she want to see in the platform that she set out to create. Hmm. All right. So um, so take me forward a little bit from you've just started based on where mm -hmm. we just were. When did, like, was there a moment where you found real traction? Was it, did it really accelerate at a certain point? And, and if it did, what, what kind of caused that? Yeah, so we have always kind of been a uh, category creator. Um, and so that is a very slow and difficult thing to build traction with. When you're not the better, cheaper, faster version of something else, it can be difficult to position uh, yourselves inside of someone's mind. Um, and what we started to gain a lot of traction behind was this idea of... Uh, a maturity curve in the podcasting market. And that concept, the, the very beginning of it happens uh, right around when we closed our Series A, uh, so about a year and a half, almost two years ago. Uh, and what we've been able to kind of put together with that is that people are interested in podcasting and it's often starts as an experiment. And how do we help that person achieve success with that experiment? And then when they see success there, then they can become more interested in some of the more advanced features that we have. So we spent a lot of time building some really powerful technology about integrating into CRM and being able to show your sales team who's listening to your podcast. But if you're just starting out and you want to see how do I even make a show, those things can be less valuable to you at that time. So we've worked a lot on like how do we bring somebody from the beginning of that experiment through each stage of success to become a, a true, you know, amplified marketing and, and casted company. Cool. All right. So there's, there's one thing I wanted to get your opinion on and then yeah. ask a question about. Um, we sell sales engagement software, which means we should hopefully be quite good at using that, right? As, mm -hmm. as doing as a drinking your own Kool-Aid is sort of the saying. So do you think that's a good thing or is that sometimes a misnomer in your, in your opinion? I absolutely see it being one of those things that's kind of both, right? Um, we're in the same seat. We use our podcasting technology. Uh, and moreover, one of our best customers internally uh, that our product team goes to all the time is our marketing team. 
because uh, they use our, our software so much. And it can be one of those things where you have an internal feedback loop. Um, and one of the things I, I talk about as a leader in the company all the time is the answers are probably not inside the business. And we should be going out and asking our customers. We should be going out and asking the market uh, to validate what we're thinking. Um, that being said, though, there's nothing faster than having a user inside uh, of your company to tell you when something could be better. Um, and I think it's from a sales perspective and a marketing perspective, paramount to demonstrate to the rest of the world, this is what optimum looks like. This is what the best use case could be. And so we strive to model an example of what podcasting can really achieve uh, if it's centered to your, your marketing strategy. Okay. So I like where you were going, but now you, you kind of give me a flavor of what the answer to my next question was. So mm-hmm. I was going to say, do you find like within cast it, it's different for every company i think but do you find that it does make more sense to do that for your own for your own self so for instance i mean we we do outbound because we enable other companies to do outbound that's pretty yep. straightforward it's not a big stretch to to decide yeah we're going to do that but you know maybe in your market the decision makers if you're going very high upstream maybe they don't do podcasts it might not make sense so it, has it worked for you does it work for you yeah, so um, we're we're really hyper focused, right? And our outbound and sales strategy is like somebody who is either already has a podcast, uh, especially those who maybe have created their very first season or first couple of episodes, and now that they've gone through the process of trying, need a way to scale and validate what they're doing. Uh, and so that conversation is pretty easy for us. Um, But there's also the education. This is the category creation part of it, right? It's that we have to uh, help folks who are skeptical. And this is every every technology out there goes through this phase of crossing this chasm into the skeptical market. And so as podcasting continues to take off and there's that huge wave there, we have to rely on that momentum. And we help the folks who are skeptical see that there's a lot of value to giving it a shot. Uh, and so that's tricky. Uh, but again, modeling, like what does success look like? If you do it well, here are the, the outcomes. Uh, and the more transparent you can be about the outcomes, uh, the easier it is for a CMO or a marketing leader to buy into it. Sidebar, how much have yeah. you talked to Sangram Vajre? That was our first customer. There we go. So, I, I, I figured yeah. that because obviously I heard Terminus. I know he's from there. Crossing yeah. the Chasm is something that he plugs all the time. One of his yeah. favorite books. And um, Category Creation, I had him on our, on our virtual conference to talk about that because yeah. he talks about it. So I'm, in my head, I'm going, where's this all coming from? Yeah. Sangram. <laughs> yeah, Sangram was a huge influence on us. Yeah, and a lot of the language and things that, that we talk about all the time, yeah, are definitely big topics of his. And he helped us think about and frame our business around so category creation um lots of work and some of it doesn't pay off for quite some time hard to prove at times talk to me about some of the sort of unintended unexpected pains that you've like encountered as you ha- as you go through this because i think you should expect if you're going to create a category a it may not work point mm-hmm. blank like there there are a lot b you're going to have to do a lot of content which is going to take a lot of time and resource before you even see a snippet of repayment and right. then there's also going to be people who just say, why don't you just other category that's already there? Even if you're yeah. kind of not really that, but you might be a little bit. So there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of things like that, which you should just expect. But I always say it's kind of like building a house when you're building a company. You can think of everything, but you still forgot to order the roof and it will come late yeah. and over budget. There's just something. Exactly. So, so what kind of things did you see? Yeah, I think uh, and my, my perspective is pretty biased from my position, which is you know leading our product and, and customer side. But... I think the thing that we all hoped was that we would achieve a just clear product market fit that would then go right into a skeptical market and we would cross the chasm and it would be linear. And that story would happen step one, step two, step three. Uh, and it's, it's not quite a straight road. It's, it's very curvy and there's moments where you stop and scratch your chin and like, am I lost? And what that looks like is, you know, we'll, we'll demonstrate a lot of success with a customer and then the next customer over uh, will lose their whole budget on their podcasts. And we're like, but why? 
Like, aren't we the reason that they can keep their budget and demonstrate the value so that they have their budget? Uh, and because these customers are so different in their commitment to this channel, we have found ourselves at mercy to it. And it can be difficult to discern, is, is this something that Cassidy's solution is missing? Uh, or is it something that the channel, uh, you know, unavoidably the, the newness of the channel creates that? So the unexpected thing for me was how do I identify true trends with my customers? How do I really identify product market fit uh, and success with what we're bringing to market while we're getting such lumpiness in our go to market and our um, retention? Um, and of course, you throw in a pandemic and then you throw in, uh, you know, the economic worries that is crunching every marketer's budget across the land. Uh, and that becomes even more <laughs> data that you have to account for. And, and you ask those questions like, OK, is it me? Is it them? Is it a combination? And how do I discern, you know, the right next thing to, to bring to my customers to help them keep their budget, justify it and, and hopefully keep paying us money? Yeah, um, lots of context to help you interpret all of your, you know, data very differently. Uh, I, I appreciate right. how difficult that is. Yeah, yeah been there. I know what you mean. Um, okay, so uh, a couple more questions, Adam, and then, uh, then yeah. I think we'll wrap up. So uh, I'm sure there's plenty. There's always plenty of any any founders. Uh, I've made a, enough mistakes in my life for a whole lifetime. But uh, any mistakes that you're willing to share that you've made, which are particularly painful or important, do you think? Yeah, I think um, one thing that we all kind of warn each other as founders about is make really uh, slow decisions when it comes to growing your company, especially when you're hiring people. Uh, it's really easy to post a job rec, uh, and it's really hard to let someone go. And especially with you know the turns of the market that we've seen, we're seeing this all over you know LinkedIn, and we're seeing it all over the market. Uh, companies having to do layoffs uh, because they grew too fast or the market slipped out from underneath them. And, you know, that's a particular mistake that we fell victim to of trying to grow our sales footprint uh, faster than we were able to kind of grow our actual output in sales. Um, and you learn that lesson once uh, and probably don't repeat that mistake ever again. Um, but yeah, that, that's definitely one that I would caution a lot of, of first time founders or repeating founders is even when you think you have uh, lightning in a bottle, double check the bottle <laughs> and uh, hire slow and intentional and, you know, let each hire prove uh, that they can keep themselves busy and keep, uh, keep the, the commercialization of the business moving forward before you bring on the next one. I like that, especially considering like, not to pick on the two customers you said there, but Terminus and Drift, like quite high tech companies yeah. who you might associate with these flippant hires of loads of people and flippant layoffs. Right. But, but your advice is like, let's take it easy, make sure everything is sense and that type of thing, which, um, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not to blame, you know, particularly executives or anything like that. The, the reality is that if you, if you think, uh, your bosses or these uh, very smart tech leaders or even the billionaires know what they're doing. They probably don't. Uh, no one's able to predict what the market is doing. Uh, but um, I think if you can be uh, really intentional with how do we, how do we put out a hypothesis and test that that hypothesis is true uh, before making a big bet on it. And you can make smaller incremental bets uh, Really, in anything, hiring or, or really any decision that you're making, uh, smaller incremental bets uh, can be a, a lot safer and, and definitely a lot more effective. Okay, Adam. Well, this has been good fun. We're about up at time, but I want to yeah. ask you one more thing, if we can. And, uh, and yeah, after that, going. let's uh, let's make sure everyone knows where they can follow you and find out more yeah. about Casted. So, how do you self educate? Are you a podcast guy? Uh, uh, probably you are, because you run a podcast yeah. too, and you <laughs> That's have one, a safe assumption. <laughs> and you're on one right now. So maybe there's that. But do you like courses? Are you a book person or something else? I'm a I'm a bit of all of them. Yeah, um, I am a, a big podcast person. I love hearing uh, kind of a lot of like, you know, what, what your podcast is about, learning lessons uh, from real people uh, with real problems. And uh, the, uh, the other way that I learn a lot is um, I am an intentional uh, 
mistaker. Like I love to make mistakes. So uh, I try to kind of jump into a thing, being as ignorant as possible as I can to it uh, and finding a coach in the space as fast as I can. Uh, and I find that a person who's willing to share with me the mistakes that I'm making help me helps me learn really quickly. Uh, and thankfully, <laughs> uh, founding a company is a place where you get to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, we've had a lot of really great board members and coaches in my life that have that have helped identify where things could have gone differently or better. Uh, and that's definitely between that and podcasting are probably my two biggest uh, ways that I go about learning anything new. Fair enough. All right. And where can people find you and uh, more about Casted? Yeah, check us out at uh, casted.us. Uh, we're all over social media. Uh, if you look for Casted, we're the only one out there. Cool. Well, that, that's a good thing. If you look at my name, I'm one of the only ones, but there is a guy who's got my Twitter handle, which oh, I'd love no. to have. Very yeah. unfortunate, but hey, what can yeah. I do? So, hey, there's, um, only, uh, there's only one Adam Paterino in the world that I've found, so... <laughs> pretty fortunate not bad you, you gotta take yeah. what you can get yeah all right adam well thanks very much for coming on much appreciated yeah, thanks, um thanks everybody for sticking around if you made it this far in the episode i hope you enjoyed it no sean this week he'll be back i promise at some point um he'll be doing the intro that's how you'll know but apart from that make sure you subscribe if you enjoyed today's show and if you don't mind leave us a little review it does the world of good for us i promise you that and apart from that like i said thank you very much for listening and we'll see you on the next one guys